Todd here with Matt and Jamie Kramer from Holy Soldier again with you on Rack Talk. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the Holy Soldier time when you put your first album out. The whole world is sort of embracing heavy metal. The Sunset Strip is like the center of the world, right? Just to talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, just from the inside out as opposed to us looking outside in, right? It had to feel like the whole world is all of a sudden just looking in your direction. Yeah, at the time, it didn't feel that way. It just felt like, you know, you were immersed in it. You know, we were kids from Southern California in a band. And uh, I had been in bands playing backyard parties in Orange County, you know, for, for years. And, um, you know, being introduced to the club scene in Hollywood was uh, was uh, a new experience to me. And, and then for it to kind of blow up like it did, uh, it was super cool. Um, we never, like I said, we never thought it would ever be looked back upon as a thing or a time in you know music history, but <clears throat> um, it was really cool. Like any given Friday or Saturday, uh, you had bands flattering the Sunset Strip and you'd walk up and down between Gazzari's and the Whiskey A Go Go. And it was literally just shoulder to shoulder people walking back and forth. And, you know, you're meeting people and you're handing out flyers and um, talking to people. They're asking about the band and you're kind of hey, come to the show. And that that was really it. And that you had to work at that piece of it to get the word out. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if you print up 1100 flyers and you pass them out over a Friday and Saturday, maybe maybe 100 of those people will come to the show. You know what I mean? Um, and then that 100 might tell some other friends and they'll come to the next show along with the other 100 you just flyered and got people, you know what I mean? So it, it was it was a lot of footwork back then to do that but um yeah it was it was a really good time um a lot a lot of music uh a lot of there's, awkwardness there's no smoke there's no social media right people have to realize back in the day there were yeah. no smartphones no internet right no nothing you you had to go physically hand people a flyer piece of paper and say come see my band and they had to tell their buddies or you couldn't even fill up a room right i mean it was right. footwork like you're yeah. saying yeah, that's a good way. That's a good explanation. Exactly right. There was no social media. I mean, you've had to literally do the footwork and hand people a piece of paper to say, come see me play. And if they didn't like it, it, a lot it, of work. it wasn't going to help, right? If they came and saw you once and you were no good, they were not going to tell your, their friends to come see you the next time. So right. You, you had to bring the goods on, on show day, right? Yeah. Or it was never going to work. That's one thing about Holy Soldier, we were very dedicated to rehearsing. So, you know, we worked our jobs during the day. Um, we'd show up at, at the studio at whatever time, six, seven o'clock at night. We'd rehearse four or five hours a night, four days, five days a week. Um, and we were very, very, very strict about that. Like if somebody had something to do or they had a date or something, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of frowned upon. <laughs> it was like, come on, man, you gotta, you gotta get to rehearsal. So, um, because of that, our live show was always very tight and very, um, people always said we were a, a, a pretty good live band um, because we worked really hard at that piece of it. And I always appreciated going to see a band and when they played live and they played well live and they were tight, you could tell they were kind of like one um, that was worth the price of admission. And I always felt that we owed it to people to give them that. And so we worked really hard at that piece. I think that's what brought people back as well. Yeah, definitely. And when you, you guys had really uh, good live videos, uh, as I saw on YouTube, there's a, um, I don't know who, but someone ripped a live off of a cassette <laughs> or something and then posted it on YouTube. So the, the, footage, it, the footage is really grainy and the, the audio is kind of fucked up. But, you know, the end, I, I felt the energy, even though all, all because of all the problems. And I saw mm -hmm. that you guys are really working hard at it. So uh, it's a shame there's not much to, to see uh, live. And I, yeah. <laughs> I wish I could see you guys live, but uh, I'm a little late to that party. <laughs> you know, looking back, I mean, there's so many bands had so many more videos. Like we did the See No Evil video and that was actually a production video. And um, Me Last and Train... We talking about that. that yeah, Last no Train... Evil. Yeah. yeah, that That's was a good, it's super good camera. Good. And um, synced up to the actual uh, recorded uh, music, um, and th that's it. It's like 
we didn't get a lot of opportunity to put out a lot of videos. I don't know why that happened. I don't know if it was budgeting or, or what, but. We um, were two years too late, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. If, yeah right. if you guys had released that first record in 1988, you you would have been, I don't know how big, but really fucking big. And that, I, I wish that's, you, you did. That's something we were talking about before we got on with, with Jamie. The, the record came out in 1990, right when music was starting to shift a little bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And just two years prior was like the peak of the whole thing. Right. And yep. I mean, Striper was still huge. It had all these other Christian bands that were happening in Blood Good and White Cross and everything. And that record came out and was honestly sounded better than To Hell with the Devil did. Right. But you're on a smaller label, Murr, I think, back in the day, which had never done a rock band before. Right. You're the first. Mm -hmm. So they really mm -hmm. didn't have the mechanism in place to push a rock band. And here they have this amazing rock band. And the timing is just like uh, on the slightly other side of when it is sort of, you know, happening. Right. Do, do, do you think it was uh, just a delay? What, what have you guys thought, talked about that? Like if this would have came out in 88 as opposed to 90, it would have been a different deal. There's a couple of factors in that. And you bring up a good point in the timing, Todd, but the, uh, Part of that. So our first album, we were on a and Records. Our first deal was Word, a and &M, a and &M Word. So <clears throat> um, a and &M put a bunch of money into that record, gave us tour support, concrete marketing, did all the promotions. You know, um, I remember walking into a Warehouse Records and seeing a big cardboard cutout display of us. And I'm like, wow, it was just crazy, you know? And then um, after Steve left, before we started our first American tour, um, a and got bought up by Polygram. So our a &R guy had had the option to take a cut and pay or leave, he left. So we're playing the palace in Hollywood, we're headlining, Love and Rockets is opening up, um, sold out show. This guy shows up backstage and um, he introduces himself from a &M Records. And we said, well, where's, you know, where's Dick Bosey? And he said, well, he's gone, gone, left the company. We had no idea this merger takeover thing was happening. And um, he asked where Steve. Well, Steve had left and we had Eric to do the tour. And I could see the look on his face and we told him that. So um, needless to say, a &M didn't pick up the second option. So that was one kick. Um, the other piece to your point was, I mean, 1990, right? So we're right on the tail end of all that. Um, so timing was kind of an issue. And then, um, yeah, and then so now Murr Word Records had to take up the slack on the second record. So there was a series of events, I think, that, that kind of hamstrung us a little bit, um, timing being one. But I think all things happen the way they're supposed to happen. So it, it is what it is. But um, yeah, I think those were a couple factors. I mean, still the, I mean, the record was still pretty big and they did some pretty big tours. Now the, the band was a sort of a, a Christian band, but not, not almost as overt as like Striper was where the, the songs were never like preachy. So it, it mm -hmm. didn't have that vibe that, that, that Striper sometimes did. It just sounded like metal to me. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's, was, that's kind of weird how I got into Holy Soldier because uh, funny enough, I, I don't believe in anything, you know, I am not religious at all, but I listen to Striper because it's kick-ass metal, and then I just scroll down on Spotify where it's You Might Like, you know, and then I saw Holy Soldier and White Cross, and I, I, I looked at the picture of you guys, and I was like, damn, they look like they can fucking play, so I just clicked <laughs> on, and then clicked on the first song, I think it's Stranger or something, and I immediately hooked. So, cool. I just I don't listen for the, uh, well, I listen for the lyrics, of course, but I don't listen because it's Christian metal or whatever you want to call it. I just listen because it's good music. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's why I started. So I thought, wow, this is really cool. <laughs> and it well, wasn't until later that I realized it even was, uh, actually was Christian metal. But I mean, really good music yeah, comes across I as good music. I didn't think about it before I Googled it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Was, was so that's that what happened with the club scene too and, and the occupancy with selling out the clubs like we were because I think people were seeing the look of the band and they'd come to the show and then they dug the music. They weren't really, really uh, listening to the lyrics that much. I mean, live too, it might be hard to get them all. So um, that was a, a piece of it as well. That's how we drew so many people. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think and then they the, buy the record and they hear what we're about later. Right. Yeah. But I think that um, th there's a factor playing here that um, Dee Snyder once said in 1985 at the PMRC hearing, you put your own experiences, feelings, and thoughts into the lyrics. And, uh, and I was listening to your songs and I, you know, I ju did just that. So I didn't hear any religion, you know? I heard my own experiences and thoughts and feelings and whatever. And I you know, kind of just went with it. And it, it mm -hmm. fit me. Yeah, you know, good. Lies, for example, that song, it reminds me of my horrible fucking ex-girlfriend. And it, the song just fucking describes her perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was just all lies and bullshit. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. and the pain inside of me, that, that's just how, you know, I've had some, some issues and blah, blah, blah. So everything just kind of, I, I felt it. Mm -hmm. so, so it really you, spoke. Yeah. And that's why I've been, you know I've been trying to reach out to everyone in Holy Soldier, you know, because I just love the music and I want to get to know you guys and know the music more in depth, mm -hmm. and and learn the songs and you know get the inspiration from it, which I've definitely had. It it has affected my playing in in such a huge way. Well, that's cool. I appreciate that. It's humbling. Thank you. Have you have you thought about that? About just I mean, here you are now, several decades later people from various parts of the globe now know your music and you know you from from it has 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 that sunk in a little bit that you know that this has followed you through you know your life now and have you had other contact from people in faraway places uh about about holy soldier about the music yeah for sure um you know like my facebook page is like my personal page and i need to build an artist page but i have a ton of people that are you know requesting friendship or whatever so I, I i'll get back to all those when i build my artist page but um i yeah a lot of people will message us hey you know i was really into your band and now i'm a pastor um and you know it's the one of the reasons that we took this route was we all have a story right um i saw a lot of people circling the drain in my life um back when I was in um, another band before Holy Soldier and, and I wanted to do something different and, and that I wanted something positive, you know, to come out of my music. And that's kind of why we took this path, but I'm going to tell you some of the most rewarding things are those messages I get from those people all this time later, you know, and, and to hear, um, you know, how, how the music is still touching them or, you know, their kids are now messaging me because their parents listen to it. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's really crazy. Like Matt, you know, he's, you know, what are you, 20 years old? And, and yeah. you know, you dig the music. Yeah. Wasn't even born right back when. Yeah. I didn't have this, a thing is, this thing's 34 years old. This seems right. way older than you. Um, yeah, I have guitars but, that are twice the age I am. So that's yeah. kind of weird. So, it, yeah, it's really crazy to see the ripple effect and how it just keeps, you know, just, I mean, it's like any band, right? Like, there's kids that love Led Zeppelin and because their parents listen to it or, or Pink Floyd. And, you know, it's because they're just really good bands with great music. And, um, but I was, I remember there's a couple times where it really impacted me. I think we were playing, we played Red Rocks in Denver and it was a sold out show. We opened for Petra and um, I was the guy that always wanted to towel off and go meet the people, you know, and I'd go out the side door and you know sign whatever they wanted me to sign and 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 just meet the people and this kid comes up and he he told me that he was gonna commit suicide and then somebody gave him our record and he's now you know he turned his life around and he's going to church and and he's you know it it it, it touched him in a way that really impacted his life and so you know it's like i can't take the credit for it it's it's you know something much bigger than me um, doing the work, but it's, uh, it's humbling to be part of that and to see something that we put out touches people. Um, so there's, there's no better reward, you know, it's, sure. it's, it's really cool. Have, have you thought about doing like a, have there been any talk of some of the bands that you sort of came up with doing like a reunion thing, like getting members of white cross and left of blood good he passed away recently and just getting together yeah. and doing like a tour thing. Um, not so much a tour. I mean, the festivals, I think, um, they just had one. I can't remember the name of it, but, um, our drummer Terry is in a band called human code and it's, uh, Mike from Baron cross 
uh, and they just did some festival. And I think there was, I think White Cross, them, um, there's a whole bunch of bands that played. I don't know what the attendance levels were, but we had offers to go do stuff like that. But, um, you know, we don't really, we're not much touch with Steven lately much. I haven't talked to him in a couple of years. Do you and, want to know something you know, cool? I talked to Steven a few weeks mm -hmm. ago. Okay. Uh, he's on my friends list. I, I, you know, as I said, I contacted everyone. <laughs> and um, on his birthday, actually, and I was, I was just telling him, I'm wishing him happy birthday and all that. And I, I told him I play guitar and I've done covers of your songs and all that shit. And then mm -hmm. he, out of the fucking blue, he said, well, if it all works out, we should do a tour together. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. That's so cool. he, he's still doing music and all that. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I think he's a really like cool, cool guy. Yeah, he's um, he was a very good lyricist because he, the way his brain works, um, he's very deep that way. Um, and it, it's a it's a talent. But um, to, for Holy Soldier to do something, I I can't imagine we would. Um, I know that's you know a lot of people would probably want to see that, but. You know, I'm working on this new project. You know, Andy's doing music with Dave Kersner, and um, um, he plays with Britt Floyd um, mm -hmm. sometimes. And when they're in town, and Michael did his solo record, and and he's got a couple things going on. And Terry's playing with Human Code. So, and then the other thing is, Andy and Mike are in Florida. Terry and I are in California. I'm not sure where Steve's yeah. living. It's just you know, not that uh, we couldn't. Stephen is moving to England. I think he said. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, it's probably been a year, a year or more since I've talked to Stephen. But um, yeah, I mean, trying to get everybody on the same page to do that again. It's like we really appreciate what we did. And, you know, that's kind of over there. And I would like to move forward with, you know, the, the project I'm doing and, and my new ideas. He was telling us about... Um... I had asked about maybe doing a holy soldier reunion and said, you know, that was a great thing, a great time, but really it's sort of, it's done. It's, it's several decades, I guess, in the past. Now there are a lot of people doing these reunion tours now, you know, Yeah. but uh, maybe too many. What do you, what do you think? Is this something that uh, is really getting sort of overdone now because there's no good music. Um, people have to make, you know, there's, <laughs> I'm sorry, Ted. there's clearly a need. Um, I mean, there's a lot of the 80s bands that are touring and my wife and I went to a show here at the um, Pacific Amphitheater and I think it was Winger, Warrant, um, I don't remember who else, uh, Skid Row. Um, and they're, they're all sounding good. I mean, they're, they're, they're bringing it. So that's, that's my point. It's like, if you're going to come back and do it again, you got to bring it, right? And uh, you know, we're, we're, we were talking earlier about singers, you know, and it's like, you know, I, I, I not sure if Steve could or want to do the Holy Soldier sound again, um, you know, trying to get everybody on the same page and want to do that again um, might be a challenge. So um, maybe it's better left over there. You would want to come back and do it badly, like, uh, say, Motley Crue. <laughs> 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 no comment but right. yeah i definitely would definitely wouldn't want to be looking bad for sure so no no because it, it's everything that's recorded from the band sounds sounds good i mean it's still generating fans and new interest mm -hmm. and that's that's mm -hmm. really i think you can tell good music bad music just dies and goes away right good mm -hmm. music generates new fans and new interest decades yeah. Right. Just look at Justin Bieber. <laughs> and I mean, yours still is. Do you think about that, about the legacy of the music you've created about, I mean, once you're heaven forbid gone and passed on that people will still be, you know, interested. Well, I, I got, I got news for you. Nobody gets out alive. So right. <laughs> we, right. Will be, we will be gone at some point, but sure. um, yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah. Like I said, it's super humbling to, to hear people still, you know, into our music and something that we did is still carrying on. It's, it's a really cool feeling for sure. When the only the, thing I, I wish I, I just, I want more of it, you know, <laughs> you can only listen to the first two albums so much, you know, but I love the, both those albums and I, I, I listen to them almost like every day. And when I'm at oh, work wow. and I'm out and about and the, the songs just, they're, they're there for me. So I'm, I'm never going to stop listening. 
you know, I'm going to be 80 years old sitting in my wheelchair or something. <laughs> I'm be jamming all the time. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I mean, some of the music that really influenced me when I, I was younger, I still listen to, you know, because it's, it's right mm -hmm. here. It's always with you. So it's good. It's cool. Sure. The, the first, I mean, the first album, especially, it's, uh, it seems to have almost grown further in time than it did almost at the start, right? Mm. There are groups all over the internet, there are forums, and the band is still still talked about, even though something you created a long time ago. Do you, the new music That's you're working on, will it have anything from the old stuff in it? Like, will there be bits of Holy Soldier in the new stuff just because it's you? Um, so that's interesting. You brought that up. So, um, the stuff we're doing is, is, I mean, I don't want to use the word a little more mature, but, um, it's going to have a rock pink Floyd heavier. It's going to be this really cool thing. And, um, you know, Andy's influences are, you know, pink Floyd and, and, uh, um, you know, Genesis and that kind of thing. Um, the singer we're, we're working with at the moment, um, same, same thing. And, you know, I still write now. I mean, I'm, I'm into blues. I'm into all this different stuff. So, you know, my writing style has changed as well, but, um, you know, I, I put this, I actually recorded this one song that it, it's definitely more upbeat and it, it kind of not, not to be a spoiler, but it kind of sounds, <laughs> I think you'll like it. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's hard to get that out to get that out of how you write you know what i mean so you can evolve but there's going to be pieces in there that are always going to sound like you so if when, when, you listen to, when you listen to it you can tell that it's you because it's literally your dna in the in the notes and everything so when i so sent it to david Safiro, he goes that's jamie right there so yeah <laughs> if, if, if that's if that's any indication then there you go. <laughs> I think that's a good thing. <laughs> in in your lead playing, I, I definitely hear, you know, sort of your style in your lead playing. And mm -hmm. I mean, I play lead myself and I'm sure as a lead player, you can hear other players when you notice it's them playing. There are certain, like Matt said, it's their DNA that sort of comes through in, in the leads. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. in my rhythms, no one can tell it's me. In your rhythms, though, I can tell it's you because your rhythms and your leads share a lot of DNA. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's not and, always you know, common. Yeah. David Spiro brought that up too. He's like, you know, I, I laid some layered some solo tracks on that cut I sent him and he said the same thing. It's really weird. I mean, I, I guess you are who you are and, and you can't really run from that, which I guess is okay. But um, my rhythm technique and he said that too. He's like, I can totally tell he's like your, your rhythm technique just stands out and when I play solos, the same thing. So um, it's it's kind of um, unmistakable. Yeah. I play, which I don't know if it's good or bad. I hope it's good. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's, it is what it is, I guess. When I sit down and try and learn the, all the Holy Soldier songs, you know, the, the rhythm really stands out to me because the, the riffs are very intricate, but they just they just work basically but you know as you you were playing um see no evil here uh, not too long ago and i was i was looking at your fretboard and i was like holy fuck i play that wrong <laughs> so you know not i can't hear everything that you're doing but i know that there's something kind of missing and uh -huh. i've been learning a lot of those weird chords that just make it mm -hmm. sound like mm -hmm. you so that's mm -hmm. been that's been a journey and a half <laughs> Yeah, I know it's 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 a struggle. I, same thing. It's like I'm trying to learn John Mayer. Or, by the way, is amazing guitar player, um, or like Andy Timmons. I you know I, I was pl playing Electric Gypsy and learned that song, and and you can't sound like him. You just have to do your own incarnation of it because to, to play it exactly like that person is is going to be super difficult. And then I mm -hmm. see people doing tutorials on YouTube, whether it's a Randy Rhodes song, and, and you're like, wow, like they nail it you know so mm -hmm. they actually sound like it so you know it sometimes it's hard to do and and some people get it i don't know i, th I think you're totally right when you said tone is in the fingers and that's something people struggle with they think if, if i buy this guy's guitar and, and gear i'll sound like him mm -hmm. well no you'd still need his fingers to sound all oh, yeah. the way like yeah. like a, you know and only you have your own you know fingers and your mm -hmm. your lead and rhythm stuff though it seems 
melodically connected. Like when you're writing a lead or when you're writing a rhythm, they have a lot mm -hmm. in common just in terms of uh, melodic construction. Like it's not just this is a riff and this is a shreddy bit, you know, mm -hmm. there's there's a connection between your rhythm playing and lead playing that that I don't hear in most players. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, what? I give Neil Sean a lot of credit for that because I was a big Journey fan and Neil Neil's solos are like that. Mm -hmm. You know, he'll he'll kind of trail into the melody of the song into a solo mm -hmm. and kind of lead you in and then he'll rip your face off somewhere in the middle. Right. And then, you know, trail out. And I kind of always approach it the same way. It's like a solo should kind of build up mm -hmm. um, and choose your notes, you know, carefully. Mm -hmm. That just... Uh go go completely crazy with it and your solos like your rhythms are written right i can tell there's an intentionality yeah. you know, oh, yeah. just, here's the solo bit and just okay brrr, whatever and then go back to the rhythm and yeah that, no no yeah the solos are all all constructed um i work them up before we go in the studio and then um you know the studio was a very frustrating part for me because you know i'm a live player and um there's a lot of pressure in the studio. And so I'm sitting across from David Sapiro, who's a really great guitar player himself um, and songwriter. And we're in the control room and I'm sitting with my guitar and, you know, you rip a solo and you, you know, he's like, yeah, I'm very good about that. And then he'll look at you and he goes, no, nah, that second bar, there's, you do a better one. You're like, damn it. So then you do another one. And then, you know, you're about six deep before, and then maybe the second or third one was the good one, but he keeps pushing you to see <laughs> something else in there. Right. And then, and then you, you, you get, you start to get a little frustrated because you just played it like six or eight times. And then he's like, no, nope, we got it. I think the third <laughs> So he's just, he's just being a good producer, right? He's just trying to push yeah. you to see if yeah. just, there's a better one in there. I want it. So just keep giving yeah, it to me. That's exactly what he says. There's a better one in there and he wants to get it out of you. Until your fingers are burnt. And he's like, yeah, you're done. Okay. I'll just choose from these. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly oh. right. How did you guys start working with him as a producer? I mean, you go all the way back with him, right? Um, I think that came, um, word records uh, suggested him. And then um, we had heard his solo record and um, we really kind of liked his uh, perspective. And so we met with him and um, we kind of ripped rip through a set and we had worked up a demo tape and gave it to him and he wanted to work with us. So like I said, we went into pre-production and it was just really deconstructing a lot of things we already had. Um, like See No Evil was already a song, but it wasn't See No Evil. Um, uh, Love Me, um, I wrote that, that hook in Love Me and um, it almost didn't make the you record. You need to show me that. You need to send me a video on how to play that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it almost didn't make the record because they thought it was a little too bubblegummy. And again, oh, no, I'm very that, melodic. That's seriously yeah. one of the best songs on that record. Oh, thank you. Um, I, when so I, I played that, I headbanged so hard that I, my neck hurts. <laughs> Well, Steve would always tease me every time we're playing that song in rehearsal, he would start like, he goes, I, I envision like a, a bunch of nuns going down the street in a convertible singing that song. I'm like, really? You know, <laughs> so it, it was, they always teased me about it because oh, don't do that. that's easily, you know, oh, I can listen I, to that all day and I, I, I do. <laughs> that's cool. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just, I, I think the melody piece is really the most important part. And sometimes people want to put technical uh, in, in the way of that. And, you know, I, I'm going to tell you honestly too, when I'm writing a solo, sometimes I'll be trying to construct something and then you almost feel compelled. You've got to do something flashy, you know? Um, it's all about flashy, putting it right, isn't it? You, it's got to complement the song. You, know, uh -huh. uh, you play for the song. That's the best advice someone ever gave me. When you you play, when you play, you play for the song. And when it's time to do a solo, do the fucking solo, but then play for the song again. Yeah. So that that's yeah. my when when I play. You know, I don't just you know as you see on YouTube, people just playing just endless notes over songs. I play mm -hmm. for the song. You know, follow the song as it should go, because that's yeah. what you do. You don't show off. You know, you put your ego to the side. And you're one collective, you know, mm -hmm. thing. Yep. Jamie, as you watch YouTube now and watch, you know, players trying to come up, 
Um, do you wish you could go in there to each of them and just give them any advice if there was some? Well, what might it be like just watching them? Because some of them are pretty good, you know, but they're all very, uh, not well, a lot of very young and uh, <laughs> they could use some decent advice. What, what would you say? To them? Um, just practice. Just practice. Uh, I used to sit on the couch at the studio and watch Bugs Bunny and just sit there and and knowing knowing your instrument and being comfortable with your instrument is is really the key. So um, I've known people that decided after watching a concert of someone they liked to go buy a guitar and then they sell it two months later because the fact of the matter is it's hard when you start out and and you have to put the time in and if you're not willing to do that. So Zach Wild, um, I saw an interview with him and he would literally play in his bedroom all night long go to school and then fall asleep in class and then come home and play all night long. I mean, he never put his guitar down and he, that he was literally me when I was in school, I, I played yeah. all day and all night after school, I fell asleep in class, went home, played more guitar. I sat for like eight hours a day. And yeah, I wish I, and could, that's I, I wish I could have the time to do that again, because I've been slacking Life. recently. Well, life gets in the way, right? We have to yeah, work. Yeah, I have that. to, you know, I work my ass off every day now because I have to get my fucking education done and all that. Mm -hmm. But like after I'm done now, I'm done like next year and I move back to my hometown where my band is. And then we're just going to hammer it down track after track and just get out there. There you go. Practice yeah, is, good. Wanna, is the key. I, I don't want to live Practice more, spending more, time with your instrument. Yeah. <laughs> is the, the important piece regardless of what you're playing spending time with your instrument um the other advice i would give people is don't try to play fast you need to play slow first so there's a video out there on like playing an arpeggio right and people want to kind of rush through it and it becomes very sloppy um there's a video a timeline video um and it shows like hour eight hour 20 hour yeah hour 40 and then you're at hour 20 and it's still very staccato you know they're not sweeping that thing and and people don't understand the time it takes i mean an arpeggio is not an easy thing to play very smoothly and and easily and then there's people that just rip them off up and down the neck left and right it's because they spent hundreds of hours you know learning the muscle memory of how to do an arpeggio correctly so any lick is like that whether you're playing you know pentatonic blues or you know you're playing you know some uh arpeggio uh minor scale in in you know some crazy thing so you just have to spend the time to be familiar with what you're doing and the instrument and i think that's where people lack i think people just want to play and they skip that piece so that yeah. would, that would be the advice i give Kind of like I do. <laughs> Skip the middle part. I just <laughs> I, I I basically know the chords, the, like the basic chords, but I don't know any like scales or you know anything like that. I just play and where the note feels right, I and play it. Well, actually, I'm, I'm self-taught, and at first I didn't know any scales either. But once I sort of learned after a few years, I picked up basic scales. I mean, if 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 you can just learn ma major, minor, and pentatonic, I mean, that's only three scales, right? You can at yeah. least be conversant enough, you know, to, to move around, yeah. stay in key. Yeah, I, the only thing I've learned is I just listen to the song and then I just play the notes that kind of fit it, I guess. Well, that's, that's how I started. I think that's how a lot of people start is basically you trust yeah. fear, you know, but now yeah, I, don't, I, I don't have any formal training because I, I was like, what, 10 or 11 years old when I went to that teacher. And that, that, that was all I can remember is just going up and down the three or four chords. Well, that, they, I they kicked me out for the first five years. How about you, Jamie? Were you self taught or did you have an instructor when you were starting out? Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I got my first guitar at 13. And um, I had an instructor for a very short time, but a lot of it was just sitting in my room, just trying to, you know, learn some of the songs I, I heard on the radio or on my uh, cassette player or whatever. And then um, I was in a band at 15. And so you're just kind of learning by ear and playing it probably incorrectly, you know, for the yeah. most part. Sure. sure. Um, but yeah, I was, I was self-taught a lot. And then just actually playing with other guitar players um, taught a me lot. a lot. 
that's just that's where I learned the most is playing with other people and sitting down or jam, jamming with other people that um, you really start kind of picking things up. Yeah, that I think is something of a lost art now because of, you know, the way music sort of works. People get a, a laptop and some software and you can do it all in your bedroom, but then you don't right. really get to play with other people, which is a big part of growing as a player is playing mm -hmm. with other people and playing off of what they're doing and learning, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I think that's, it's almost gone away now that uh, you, you don't see that bands like people now are just, it's one person and they'll make mm -hmm. music by themselves, put it on Spotify, but it, it lacks a certain amount of cohesion that you get, I think with other people involved, like you said, everyone touches a riff, right. Sure. And it can become better just because everyone else sort of had their hands on it. Sure. Yeah. Do you notice yeah, that in music now? It sounds more isolated when you listen to, you know, players on YouTube. Do you notice that? Yeah. It's, I hear it when I'm listening to them. It sounds like, have, has anyone else ever put their hands on your music? Because it, it sounds like it's just too isolated. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. It sounds very contrived. It sounds very canned. Um, and like I said earlier, like the stuff I'm recording now, I want, I want the other guys to get their hands on it because um, I'm writing from my own perspective and my own ear. And it, it, when you have more eyes on something, it, you get a bigger picture, right? The picture can change and become more beautiful when other people are getting their, their hands and, and eyes on it. So um, yeah, yeah, Todd, to your point, I think there's some music that, that does that. And then you hear, you know, like Dave Grohl, um, who I think writes most of their stuff and it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, there's that, <laughs> yeah. You know, not, not all of us can be Dave Grohl, but no. Uh, but yeah, I think some of these guys on YouTube, uh, you know, and, and you know, a lot of these artists or, or these, uh, you know, I, I call them guitar influencers now because they're not, they've never been in a band or right. maybe, but, but they're, you know, they've got a million followers and um, they've got a signature guitar, but they're, you know, nobody knows who they are other than their YouTube followers. And yeah, um, That's yeah I mean, I, there's a market for that. They're entertaining. They're, you know, they're entertaining to watch, but um, at the end of the day, uh, can they write a song at the end mm -hmm. of the day? Can they put some feeling into something and, and, and make it make you feel it? Right. Will anyone be hunting them down in 30 years to ask them what it was like to write that song? Right. I mean, you right. Know, if it's not good music, it doesn't really survive. You know, instructional right. videos are different than good songs, you know, and right. The stuff you guys wrote, I mean, it was, it was great. So I, I think it will live. Whereas Thank you. a lot of stuff I don't think is going to last. I mean, no. impressive sure long <laughs> lasting eh, maybe not now dave you bring up dave's a good point dave was a drummer right yeah so yeah i learned drums a long time ago and it was the best thing i ever did as a guitar player because you are mm -hmm. connected to the rhythm right which is yeah. the backbone of the whole thing and if you're not connected to the rhythm you're just sort of dancing around it you know then mm -hmm. your your playing is very rhythmic. I always felt like so you almost play more like a drummer. Did you, are you a drummer by chance or a bass player or something? Yes. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I started so. on drums. I knew it. I started on drums. Too, so I was risking it on that one because it could have been flat wrong. But I I thought yeah he plays like a drummer. I can hear the rhythm in his playing. You know. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and that's what makes i think you're playing and you're riffing cohesive and and good frankly is that you write with rhythm in mind instead of just writing mm -hmm. on top of it mm -hmm. thank you, you know? thank you appreciate that and it makes a huge difference um th that advice i would give to everyone learn to play drums if you're a guitar player <laughs> learn to play bass and drums right not yeah. not not just with a mouse and a keyboard but like an actual drum kit yeah you know separating your hands i have a bass too i have two basses actually there we go. it's my favorite so yeah i play <laughs> i wish i could play drums i've tried i suck I won't. it's okay you it's okay to suck i mean just that, <laughs> it's all right the, the practice i think of learning the drums it helped me tremendously in guitar being able to count time be on time and so many players now have to have a click track you've noticed this when you're in the studio you hear the click right when you're recording pro tools or whatever well, back in the day, as I'm sure you know, that didn't exist. You listened to the drummer. And if you couldn't follow the drummer, you couldn't record, right? When, when you were first recording, was there a click going or were you guys? Yeah. 
even back yeah, then. Yeah, so we, we, re we recorded back, back in the day on two inch tape. <clears throat> and if you had to punch in something, I mean, you would literally splice tape to fix one little beat. And um, so the click track would go and then um, we would all be isolated and play along with Terry laying his drum tracks. But um, Terry, to get so great live drummer, Terry would do solos with wiffle ball bats and, and he was an amazing live drummer. <laughs> but the studio is very, very unforgiving. And um, Terry, I will never forget this. So we're in pre-production in Fresno on that first record. And Dave, Andy and I, we're all, and Steve would go off and write lyrics. And so we're all in this room and we're sitting with our guitars and got a little four track and we're trying to work stuff up. And Terry's in another room with headphones and a click track doing this for eight hours, like a day, like getting it. And he was a really good drummer, but I mean, he, he, he would do a little bit of this because when he plays live, his meter would kind of shift. Right. You can't have that in the studio. No. So um, Dave recognized that early on and, and put him in this regiment of just headphones, a click track. And then, um, yeah, he nailed it. And, and so when you're trying to edit in the studio, that click track's so important because if you're off a little bit, and it, it's, it's, it's not going to work. Right. Totally. The, now, now oh. these days, um, live even people, because the lights sync up to the click. So now the entire band will be playing to the click. So the lights will all sync up to it and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But that's a fairly recent thing. I'm, I'm guessing you guys didn't play live to a click. Did you both play to your drummer? <laughs> Um, no, we didn't actually. So <clears throat> we, uh, we did not because we didn't have the earpieces back then. Like everybody's got these ear monitors now. So our live shows, it was sound check was so important because, you know, your wedges and, you know, when you're playing on really big stages, it's, it's a really weird phenomenon. Um, I've been on stages where I can't actually hear Terry, the drummer, sure. because I'm over on this side. Terry's in the middle on this big drum riser. Michael and, and Andy are on the other side and, and the sound's going straight out. So I can't hear them. Mm. So you really rely on the monitor mix. So I would have the side fill with everybody and then some of my guitar and then my front wedges would be vocals and then some of my guitar with some of the band mix. So no matter where I was, because I had a wireless, I needed to hear everybody. Mm. And when you're playing small places, it's not such an issue. But when you're playing the bigger stages, um it's 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 crazy and until you experience it you would you wouldn't even believe you couldn't hear somebody with an amp on the other side of the drum riser when you're on a big stage because it's going straight out so the the monitor mix was super important but now they've got these little ear monitors that are custom made and you get everything you need right in your ear which is nice cool. <laughs> sure but <laughs> so i hate to interrupt but we have 10 minutes left oh gosh go ahead I don't know. I was going to say it. I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> that, that I just got the, the notification. All right. Well, the, the, the live thing, like you mentioned, um, so many players now that play bedroom players have never played live and may never play live. So I they, have played live. <laughs> it's, I've played a little live, certainly nothing like my, Jamie. My first live gig, it was at my school, 1,300 people. Wow. Nice. That's a, that's a good one. Yeah, it's a good yeah. gig. I uh, yeah. I was shaking after I was done. <laughs> you know, it's really an interesting phenomenon. And I was talking to David Safir about this too. Um, I, I play better on stage in front of a bunch of people than I do in front of three people in a room. Yeah, it's, it, I don't it, know it, what it, it is. It makes you feel a certain way. Yeah, it's it just, I choke. It's like I, yeah, I close yeah. up. You put me I, on stage I, I, like... I know I know what you mean because when I play I, I I play for for my coworkers you know at work and I bring a small amp and a, and a guitar and I'm really nervous and I'm missing all the notes and shit and when I when I was in front of like a thousand people and everything was just smooth <laughs> but it's weird right. to be honest what was yeah, a what was great. a big show that you played like one of those big stages big crowd does any of them come to to mind back in the day. Yeah, um, I mean, the Palace in Hollywood was a big show. Um, Red Rocks, obviously, was one of the biggest shows we've ever done. Um, I think I forgot what the attendance at Red Rocks is, 14,000 or something like that. Wow. Um, we headlined a big show in Corpus Christi at a, a, a big theater. Um, I want to say it was 
six or 8,000. Um, then the interesting thing about being on tour is the booking company will book your tour based on your airplay and your draw, mm -hmm. right? So in the cities where you're getting a lot of airplay and a promoter can fill a 5,000 seat theater um, or bigger, uh, they're, you know, they're gonna book you there, but then you've got a tour bus, a truck, roadies, and a band on per diem. And so you can't just drive to each big date, right? So you have to fill in the gaps. So the booking company would fill in all the gaps. So one night you might play Red Rocks and the next night you're playing Joe's Bowling Alley. Mm. And then the next night you're playing um, maybe a theater or a, a really big club. And then the next night you're playing some small little place, right? <laughs> and everybody does it. I remember when Skid Row back yeah. in the 80s were here with Bon Jovi, they played this little club in Orange County um, just to play, you know? Yeah. So you, you have to pay the bills and you have to keep this big machine moving. So you have to, you know, play every night. And um, and I, I thought it was cool because the people that really want to see you will drive to go see you in a small place. So you're filling those places up as well. But um, yeah, it's, it's just really unique because it's just like this in the whole tour. Unless, unless of course, you're Bon Jovi and you're playing right. the but, um <laughs> But yeah, on, on that level we were at, it's it, it was a little bit different. But the big the big stages are fun. The big shows are a lot of fun because there's so much energy. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to get off stage on those big shows. You just I, I could have played all night long. It was just so fun. Sure. Have you thought about doing like a you know just a like a short like a documentary type thing? I'm sure you have video clips and stories and you know all sorts of cool <laughs> stuff just about that time, you know. That's a great question. I have not thought about that actually. Um, I mean, I, I don't know who would watch it, but um, well, you got a, a yeah. lot of fans. I mean, <laughs> I <don't watch> it. <laughs> we've got a lot of tour stories that are fun, like uh, you know, blowing our whole per diem for the week at a fireworks store in, in the Midwest somewhere, <laughs> and and having a firework fight on top of the tour bus and the and the truck <laughs> with the roadies, you know. Um, <laughs> Stuff like that, you know, and, and uh, it was just, there was a lot of fun. There was a lot of shenanigans. I was a big practical joker. Um, I would, I, nobody wanted to mess with me back because the retaliation piece. But, so severe. Uh, <laughs> this was really funny. So we had, we had this um, really loud horn um, off a truck or something. And um, one of my techs and I were up late and we got this, diabolical plan to wire it into the electrical of the tour bus and we talked to the bus driver and we said when we say three we want you to hit the brakes and swerve really hard and we're going to blow this horn well i'm going to tell you right now i've never seen guys stick to the ceiling like i just remember michael michael was in his bunk in the tour bus and all fours were on the ceiling like 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 a cat and it was just Stuff like that, right? Like I'll never forget those kind of things. And they were, it was just so much fun. Like I remember one time Michael was sleeping, we taped a firework above his face on, in his bunk and lit it and just just silly stuff. And it, every day was like that, you know, it was just, right? you know, you wake up, you go to sound check, you go eat, you play a show, you're back on the bus and, right. and then you go to the next town. It was a good time. Are you on, uh, are you on TikTok? Uh, I just thought about that. Are you doing TikTok stuff? It's big, you know, big with the kids. Now. I have not. I think people are like killing on TikTok and I have not done any TikTok. I'm not, I haven't put out YouTube videos or anything, but um, I've got friends that are doing it and uh, you no, know, maybe I should. Well, I mean, just after talking to you a little bit, you've got a ton of cool stories and, you know, from a very <laughs> important time in, you know, metal and music history, you know, if, if, uh, if you just start making little videos, eventually you'll end up with a, you know, a big one documentary, you know, that type of thing. Well, I need a, I need a video producer, I think, so to help me with it. So maybe we. Well, me and Matt could help. Yeah, we're, we we can help. No problem. There you we'll go. To, we'll figure it out as we go. Yeah. For sure. So I have one final thing to say sure. um, to you, Jamie. And first of all, it's a great honor and a privilege to have you here uh, on our show and to talk to you. You know, for me, it's a it's a dream come true, to be honest. Um, so I want to invite you to sometime it's you know really no rush i'm still finishing up my education and all but i would love to have you do a guest solo or whatever on electric steel at some yeah. point if you want to yeah i'd love to yeah that would be fantastic Absolutely. you heard it here first folks 
<laughs> Guess solo. Next electric steel up. Yeah, sure. That would be awesome, though. Seriously. Yeah, that cool. would be cool. Definitely. Well, but, I guess. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We thanks should, for coming, man. Thanks so much. Hey, my McGregor. pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. Hopefully, we can do another one when your 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 project is uh, hopefully closer to completion. We can talk about some of the music, or hear it, and share it with yeah. people. And you know, for sure. Thank you very much for being here. We will see you next time on Rack Talk. <laughs>